Trey, will you give us the stats for 2013's mega hit Concordia? Mega hit. Um, all right. So Concordia designer, Matt Gertz, um, artist Marina Farenbach. Matt Gertz is credited as an artist as well. And Dominic Mayer. Uh, this is a two to five player game. And um, kind of one of the cool things about this game is that there are tons of different maps. There have been a bunch of uh, expansions. Now, we're not going to talk about the expansions in this review, but just just playing the base game. Uh, this is one of those games like Age of Steam, where how it plays and its certain player counts can vary based upon the maps that you play. And so that's one of the interesting things about it um so you want me just to get into like what what the game is actually about or were there other yeah, stuff to cover why don't i i set the stage and you you walk us through the mechanics of it okay so uh, yeah go ahead yeah i was just i was gonna read from the designer i thought I, I liked the way they described it actually so concordia is a peaceful strategy game interesting of economic development in roman times for two to five players age 13 up instead of looking to the luck of dice or cards players must rely on their strategic abilities be sure to watch your rivals to determine which goals they are pursuing and where you can outpace them in the game colonists ahem, are sent out from <laughs> rome to settle down in cities that produce bricks food tools wine and cloth each player starts with an identical set of playing cards and acquires more during the game. And Trey will now talk us through how the game actually plays. So in, in this game, you, you're kind of playing a trading company or a trading league because you're, you're establishing trading posts in other parts around the land. And so in some ways, this feels like a very, very typical you know, your Euro game where, Hey, it's a Mediterranean trading game. And there's a, you know, person on the cover, you know, kind of staring back at you. Um, so what actually makes this game different or it felt different when I first played it at BGG con back in 2013 is it has this great system of, uh, cards, which create your actions. So on your turn, the the, me the mechanics of the game are incredibly simple, where on your turn, you play a card and you play the action on that card. Um, and then it's the next person's turn. And the idea is you have a set number of actions in your hands. And once you've played a card, you do not have access to that card again until you take those cards back into your hand, which takes an entire action. Um so this means you're you're looking at these options of what you have and you're trying to decide what's the right order for me to do this all the while I'm reacting to what other people do. And so there's both kind of a board presence game where we're playing area control of the various provinces and you know we can get resources from these provinces and we're extending out our our trading lines so that we have a you know, a physical presence on the board, which I think most people coming into the game are going to look at that and say, this is where the game's at. You know, I need to expand and have tons of presence on the board. And that's, and that's half true. The other half is that there is a card drafting aspects of this game, which is that one of the cards you have in your hand is a card that allows you to purchase more cards, which gives you more actions. So you can expand your kind of uh, range of things that you can do by purchasing more cards in the game. And in addition to that, the thing that kind of is truly kind of like exceptional and elegant about Concordia is the cards that you purchase also define your end game scoring. So that every one of these action cards that you have in your hand is both a card you can play for an action on your turn, but it also will be each card allows you to score a certain thing at the end. So as you purchase more cards, like the number of times that you score in a very particular way expands so that you have this lovely balance between what is my board presence and what is my what is the hand inventory of end scoring cards that I have in the game and the tension between wanting to expand my presence on the board or use my resources, which are really limited to buy more cards is a kind of constant tension 
in the game. And you need to kind of be able to do both if you want to win. Yeah. Um, to me, the genius of the game is is what you were describing as the cards you need to take actions are also your victory conditions. To me, that was the... I still can't think of another game that does that mechanic. And that... It, 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 it reminds me almost of the feeling of playing Dominion, only in the sense that there are two gears in the game and you must be in one for half the game and then you must figure out when to shift into the other. And that first one in this one is creating your, uh, you know, your locations and, and the things that are going to score points and then shifting into buying the cards that are going to start multiplying those specific things that you think you're excelling at. Um, and that timing of, of sort of when to shift is it varies every game because it sort of depends on the order they come out. Although you sort of know the order as they're split, the, the, the deck is split into eras, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, mm-hmm. all the way up to five, depending on the number of players in the game. So you, you can know the breakdown and it, they're actually on the board is at least on the, uh, sort of base game board as a print a printout showing you how many times each card appears in each era. So you can kind of plan around it, but you don't know the exact time they're going to come out and you don't know exactly what it's going to cost you as there's a sliding scale of bonus. Right. This uh, has a system like through the ages that cards right. come into the game and the longer they're available, the cheaper they get. So like when a really desirable comes out, like anyone kind of has the option of grabbing it. It's just super spendy. But if it sticks around, it becomes cheaper and cheaper. Um, and so, yeah, that's yeah. very much a through the ages thing. This, so, yeah, super simple gameplay, but really um, rich. This is game. I'm trying to remember where it ended up in our, you know, game brain top 50. But it may have been like fourth or fifth. I, I think I had this as my second best game. Ben had this at, as his number one. Uh, I'm almost positive this was in my top five. Um, it's a yeah, ten for me. I mean, I, I have it as a ten. tend to like this game if they were, if they remember it. And you know, even going to like what you were saying about like that shift, like this game is a little bit like a splatter game where like the mechanisms can be super simple, but like actual good strategy can seem really elusive. I I admit that like my approach to the game tends to be like what you you just described, which is that I tend to like push hard for board presence early and then i've got to shift to cards later on to make sure i can score my board presence but then paul and i played with uh ben yesterday and ben's first move was to buy cards and it was like what you can do that and like that <laughs> that's that's a good use of your starting resource you mean his fir- his first play was senator straight up yeah for, he first played the never game seen that. senators that's and he cool. had a, he had a perfectly cool. good move on the on the board i thought like oh yeah. he's got a real obvious build you know build a brick city build a wine city as opening move that's standard nope he, he went and grabbed cards and uh you know ben also you know beat paul and and, and me by almost 20 points so wow. and he's he uh ben's a real champion of this game um he was uh, saying that, you know, he's played it enough now where, you know, at times when we first played this game, we thought maybe your card order might be a little bit scripted. Like, mm-hmm. hey, you have to open mm-hmm. Architect in order to go and expand your cities. Like, that's the everybody does that as their first turn. It's like, nope. Like, the more you understand the game, the more things like an opening senator might, sen- might make sense. An opening Mercator where you're, buy- you're buying and selling goods in order to set up your next move. That might that might make sense. It's it's kind of proven to be a very deep, rich game where your initial impressions might not actually pan out. And I'm still like, I'm, I love this game. I also don't think I'm that good at it. And so there's something uh, really intriguing about that. The way that it's, some splatter games are like every time I play Indonesia, I feel like I've made a step further in understanding it. And then the next game corrects me that like, no, 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 you still don't know anything about this game. You're still bad at it. So, um, it's a, it, I think it's a very interactive game in ways that are not typical for interaction. I mean, you're obviously fighting over locations on the map, but you're not ever blocked from a location. That's it right. just gets more expensive. Right. Um, you can build anywhere on the map. You just pay a multiplier in Sesteri, which is the money in the game, times the number of houses that are there, including yours. So, 
that's fine for brick because brick costs one buck and some goods. So if there's three people there, it costs you three bucks and some goods. Not a big deal to be late to that. But if you're late to silk, silk is five dollars and some goods. Uh, if you're the third one in, you're paying fifteen dollars and some goods, which is pretty much not affordable unless it's late game and you just have a ton of money. Right. It's affordable um, at late game kind of. Yeah. So, and by then maybe it's not worth it to you. So it, it it's, there is a race in the beginning of the game to a certain extent. Um, but there's always races. This game is full of races. Like remember, yeah, you're racing I did a whole cars. segment on, on, on racing and like this game is made up of a series of, of races of to get to a certain trading post first or to buy certain cards first. It always feels like you're looking over your shoulder of like, is, is somebody trying to do what I'm going to do? And I'm going to be second to this thing. Is somebody going to grab that card? Because I've already yeah. got three silk cities or cloth cities. So I really need that particular card. Nope. You know, Ben grabbed it, you know, like there it's the it's got one of my favorite games of chicken in any board game, too, which is the pre, the prefect game of chicken. So the prefect is maybe the most important in the card in the game tied with architects. So the prefect is how you produce all your goods in a region. So there's every region will have two or three goods in it. And the uh, the most expensive good becomes the bonus good for that region. So when you play the prefect, you can make a whole region produce and the person who uh, played the prefect card gets the bonus good, but then everybody who has a house there produces the good that their house is on. Um, so there's a really fun game of chicken because you would much rather, for the most part, have somebody else prefect your area and you get goods without having to spend an action. Right. And so Paul and I had a, a, a couple fun turns where we were basically playing chicken to see who could wait the longest to produce the goods we both desperately needed from an area that we both had houses in. Um, and that that's always really fun. And then there's also the fun chicken game of every time somebody plays a prefect, it flips over a tile on the board that then is worth money. And the more tiles that are flipped over, you can play a prefect and just collect all the money, which then resets the whole board. So that's a really fun game of chicken too, because at a certain point it gets so high that it's, it's impossible not yeah, to, just has to take the money. Yeah. But you never feel good about it. I mean, it's nice to get 12 bucks, but you also feel like, well, I didn't really do anything this turn other than help because everybody's happy to see you do it too, because now they can, they can re prefect those places and get their bonus goods again. And so, there's so many things where it's like, oh, I have to do this. But you're you're always interested in other people's turns is what I'm saying, is that yeah. you're always hoping they do something. And then there's the diplomat. The diplomat copies anybody's face up card they just played. So you're always interested in what other people are playing because, oh, man, I don't want to have to play my architect this turn. I want to diplo somebody else's architect. Oh, please, somebody played architect. Yes, you played an architect. That means I'm going to get to architect twice once off my Diplo, once off my own before I have to reset and hit the Tribune card. So like, you know, it's highly yeah, you interactive. Also, you can diplomat somebody. If somebody else bought a card that's very powerful, you can, yeah. you can copy the effect. And so, I mean, I think that rather than getting specific about these cards, the main takeaway is there's incredible richness to these actions that's very interactive. And it is one of those games where it isn't just about what happens on your turn. A lot of the best stuff is happening on other players' turns, both whether, you know, something bad happens where somebody, you know, was able to build in the city, you know, that you were trying to get to before you can. So now you can't afford it. But sometimes it's a good thing, which is they flip, you know, they prefected a province that you're in. And now you have the resources to kind of do your super move that you thought you were going to have to, you know, spend another round, you know, building up your resource for it. Do it. So it has it has a little bit of that monopoly, you know, good stuff, interesting stuff happens on other people's mm -hmm. uh, turns. You know, I, I talked to Jennifer a little bit about this before, and she she doesn't love this game. I don't want to speak too much for her, but one thing she said was like she found the turns in this game she called the micro turns to be like yeah. too small. Mm -hmm. um, I think from for, uh, this is just you know my taste for things like there's no such thing as too small a turn. Like the worst thing for me is long gaps where like I felt felt like oh I could walk away from the table for twenty minutes before I come back and play the game. You know, here the turns are pretty snappy, good, you know, interesting stuff's happening on other people's turns. And then I take another smaller turn, but maybe to Jennifer, like that's not consequential enough when it's, yeah. it's to your time. So again, that just is a, you know, as she said, that's a matter of, of personal uh, taste. 
Yeah, there, even- there's there, there's the, the the quickness of the turns to me leads to an addictive sort of civilization. The video game, one more turn, one more turn. Like I'm I'm always. Oh God! Get it. I want I wanted my turn again. I got I got so excited to do this thing. And yes, they are small um, for the most part, but they I'm always dying for it to be my turn again, which I always think is a good sign. It's also the case that the game, the end of the game, is always looming here, and you don't know like how much more do we really have, and it it tends to actually really accelerate at the end too. Like even though this game is not the shortest game, it doesn't overstay its welcome. And it often races to, uh, to the end in a way that's, that at least, you know, brings things to a close in a, in a very definitive way that I think is, is a strength. Uh, I mean, I think that was part of our, one part of my problems with like Viscounts the other day when we played, it's like, we felt like this game should be ending. Why isn't it ending? Like when a game overstays its welcome, that's a problem. And Concordia, I don't feel like it ever does that. Yeah. Yeah, no. And, and, and it's the scoring at the end is fun too. I mean, I, I, there's something really exciting about you, you, you never really know who's winning and it doesn't mm-hmm. do it in a way of, of memorization, like where, you know, oh, we, we've, we've all taken, you know, certain uh, contract cards and flipped them over and I haven't quite been tracking who took the most like that. That to me is an unsatisfying, I don't know who's winning, but this is really, you know, there, there's a, a lot of, okay, so Trey's definitely going for wine and he's got the Vintner card times he's gotten two of them now. So I'm doing in my head that's worth, you know, he's got at least 15, but if he places one more than that, all those cards become worth five more. So like you can get a feel just by looking at the map and sort of seeing what people are going towards, like their basic score. But you, I like the game we played the other day, I really didn't think I had won and I barely won. I, I beat Paul by one point, and I think I was ahead of you by two. I mean, like it was a really tight game, and that was really exciting. I mean, it was like mm-hmm. I, you know, we we all went into it feeling like we had done pretty good, but we all probably went into it not thinking we were going to win, which I think is which is pretty cool. It, yeah, and the question then is like, did the cards I purchased, like how many did I purchase, but also did they end up matching up with my actual? board presence correctly because it's certainly possible of like oh i think this card is going to be good for me and then it's disappointing and so you know how how well did you sync your game there's a lot of uh skill in that yeah so as kind of a final thought at least for me on this is um you know because like this is not a new game but this is a top 10 game and i think uh what i would say is like okay this is i don't know would you call this a grail game like I think this is the game that every game brainer should certainly know and have played. And I also yes. think that it yeah. is it's probably the right game like when you're when you're bringing other people into the hobby and they've said, "Oh, well, we played Catan over at a friend's house sometime and you're wondering like what's the next game that I could bring them in and play?" I think Concordia is probably that n- great next step game for, you know, your people that are fairly new to the hobby. They played Gatan, they're excited, and they're ready for something else. Uh, this game is so elegant and simple, but it, it has depth. And it, it's worked for me a number of times when I've taken people who do not consider themselves gamers, and they've gotten into the game and understood it and had a great time and are eager to play more games. Yeah, so, to, so I, I went on a vacation with my wife's family a couple of years ago, Um and she has, my wife has three brothers. Um, none of them are gamers, but none of them are not gamers. They just, they, you know, they're, they're, none of them are against the idea of gaming. They just don't game. Um, and I brought one game, which was Concordia. And the four of us sat down at night and we played it the first night. And they, they were, they was okay. They're having fun. I walloped them. <laughs> but when we, when, of course, as you should, and you know, this is definitely a game where the more you play, the better you'll be. Um, but when we, but when we, I remember when we were doing scoring at the end and we scored everything up and I could just see the light bulb turn on in all of their heads. And when the final scores came in and they figured out how the game worked, they all went, oh, this is really good. And we played it every single night. We were on vacation. And by the end, they were beating me um, and they fell in love with it. And it was so interactive. And it was like, it was like showing somebody, you know, a whole new hobby. It was like me the first time I played Bowser Galactica and like my brain exploded. Um, and I think it's, it's always been my, 
you know, what's the first game I should buy getting into this hobby thing? And it, it, it's pretty much always my go-to because it's very easy to teach, um, you know, comparatively uh, to the other games. Well, you were going to talk I, about I, the rule book because like it, this should be easy right. to well, teach. Well, I'm about but. to, yes, it is. <laughs> I'm about to get into my one negative. This is the worst rule book in board games. Um, I don't even think anything comes close. It's It's so the worst board game that I can't even think of a second place. And here's why. It's split into multiple, like there's a there's a whole double page thing on the setup of the game. Right. Then there's a separate rule book for the rules. But there are rules in the setup that aren't in the rule. I mean, it's so asinine. It it actually I get angry talking about the it makes no sense. Like who like it's mean. It's it just feels cruel. It's like somebody wanted the game to feel more complicated than it is. So watch a video or have someone teach you if you know I, I i hate this i mean if i haven't played the game in a couple of months and i want a refresher it takes me like 30 minutes to parse all the like oh right i forgot this one thing that's only written here and not here well it doesn't I, I, really I, have that many exceptions it's just it's just an example of a bad rule book because it should be an easy teach yeah and they even have and a thing even like, made I was, a great I was, I was going to a similar thing you were it. talking about where i was having to look something up and it was so difficult just to find something like, wait, how much money do we start with? Like it was impossible to find. Um, yeah. But it did have a good suggestion or, you know, debatably, is that it like for your first game, they do, they recommend you do something called like an intermediate scoring just so that, because like you had that moment with your friends there where you're saying like they did the final scoring and the light bulbs came on, mm -hmm. like they the intermediate scoring option allows that light bulb to come on at the first time that you tribune so that they understand it's like oh well the cards i have will actually determine the score that i have at the end so i need to be thinking about these multiple things and then uh and then they say like well once people know the game you don't actually do this you don't actually do the intermediate scoring but yeah. it's a necessary thing in the teach but again in a better rule book that would that would have been a, a great thing. That would have been kind of like the way that Blizzard teaches you the game by playing the game. Um, and it's not necessary for you to play a multiplayer version of StarCraft. But when you're learning the campaign, you have to learn things incrementally. Like that could have been a great thing, but the rule book's so poor that it just ends up being confusing. Um, yeah, absolutely. I want to do a quick five minutes on, or, or maybe less. I just want to run down what it means if you want to get into Concordia, because it's a little confusing right now. There are two base games for Concordia, and then an expansion and a lot of maps. I'm going to give you a 10-second description of each of them just to help you understand. There's Concordia base game, which you can buy for about 60 bucks. There is Concordia Venus, which you can buy for about 80 bucks. What's the difference? They're both base games. The difference is Concordia, the base game, came out in 2013 and comes with two maps, a sort of three, four-player map and a four, five-player map. Concordia Venus, it plays to five players. Concordia Venus came out about a year ago, two years ago. It plays to six. It has a five to six player map and a four to five player map, maybe three, four, five player map. Um, it has a different map on the other side of the main board that plays to six. And Concordia, the base game, has a different map on, on the other side of the main board that plays three or four. You can't get you can't get the one that's on Venus and not on Concordia without buying an expansion. It's very confusing. But the main difference between Venus and Concordia is Venus has a team-based mode in the game, wherein you play in teams, and there are specific rules for that. We've tried it once. It was okay. Maybe it'd be interesting. I kind of just wanted to play normal Concordia the whole time. I'm not reviewing that. I can't speak to it. Maybe you'd love it. Um, there is also a slight difference. Concordia Venus has an extra card that base Concordia doesn't. You could always take it out and play base Concordia, but that's also a variant. That's not the actual game. So Concordia Venus has a card called the Magister, which is a separate card that is not included in Concordia. People have different feelings on it. Basically, what I'm saying is if you're going to just buy one, I'd probably buy Concordia Venus. It's about $10 more. You will get up to six players if that's interesting to you. It comes with the extra card if you want to play that version, or you could take it out and play base. It comes with a co-op, you know, sorry, the team-based mode. It has a little bit more for only a little bit more money. I'd start with that. There's also an expansion called Salsa. 
It has a new resource called Salsa, which is a wild resource. It also has forum tiles, which I actually really like. Mm -hmm. Forum tiles are asymmetrical ongoing powers that you can buy throughout the game using the same way that you buy cards. You can now instead buy forum tiles and they can either be one time use superpower turn things or they can be rule breaking asymmetrical powers. I think they're super fun. Do I prefer it over base? Probably not, but is it a really cool thing to try every once in a while? Absolutely. Beyond that, there's a million different maps. I won't bore you with explanations of all of them, but if you want to play two-player Concordia, you can't get that in a base game. Two-player Concordia is great. I've played a lot of it. It's really fun. I highly recommend it. You have to buy special maps for it, just like Age of Steam. There are a couple great ones. Um, You can look them up. If you want to know right now, my favorite two-player map, it's Krita, which is in the maps pack three. But anyway, whatever player count you're looking for from two to six, there is a map that's perfect for that. Um, And you can find more information on the best maps for player numbers on BGG. But that's everything you need to know about Concordia, because if you are new to Concordia, it is actually quite confusing figuring out what the heck you're supposed to buy when you, if you go to Amazon and look at 400 different things that say Concordia. So that should tell you everything. Um, and yeah, that's it. Obviously, um, we love it. It's I have 15 games on the BGG rated 10. It is one of them. If I had only 10 games in my collection, um, Concordia would be one of those. Concur. Concur. Hey, if you enjoyed that video, you very well might enjoy the other videos you now see being suggested to you on screen. Also, we'd greatly appreciate it if you could like, share, or subscribe to our Game Brain channel. Thanks so much.